Let's pray. Living God, long ago, faithful men and women proclaimed the good news of Jesus' resurrection, and the world was changed forever. Teach us to keep faith with them. May our witness be as bold, our love as deep, and our faith as strong. Open our hearts to your Spirit, moving around us, between us, and within us, until your glory is revealed in our love of both friend and enemy, in communities transformed by justice and compassion, and in the healing of all that is broken. Guide us in the path of discipleship, so that as you bless us, we may be a blessing for others, helping make the kingdom a reality here and now by our words and deeds. And now, Lord, may those gathered this morning hear what you need them to hear, regardless of the words that come out of my mouth. Amen. Good Friday has come and gone. Easter has come and gone. Now what? That's a question we should all ask ourselves this time of year. Now what? And I think the answer depends on your view of Easter. If you think of Easter as a metaphor about newness of life, fresh beginnings, and hope for tomorrow, then you can pretty much just go on as you were, trying to be a good person with dreams for a better tomorrow centered around your own desires. But if you believe that Jesus was literally, physically, permanently raised from death, as I do, then the resurrection of Jesus can and should have huge, life-changing implications for all your tomorrows. And by life-changing, I mean both how God changes your life and how and why you seek that change. This past week and a half, all over the world, employing a whole host of traditions, believers have made their journey through the darkness of Good Friday toward the sunrise of the resurrection. But now what? What do we do when Easter comes and goes? When looking for answers to life's big questions, it's always a good idea to examine God's Word, the Bible. Luke's Gospel provides a great after-Easter story in chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. I encourage you to read the full passage later. It's listed in your order of worship, but because of time constraints, we'll just hit the highlights. Luke says it's Easter Sunday. Two men are walking along a road that leads out of Jerusalem toward the little town of Emmaus. The seven-mile walk probably feels more like 70 to the two Christ followers because of the cloud of confusion and despair and uncertainty surrounding them. For them, it's still Friday. But then the two become a trio, joined on their walk by Christ himself, though the men can't see him for who he is. Later in the day, at dinner, when a loaf of bread is torn in two in a wonderful echo of the disciples' last supper, it's only then that their eyes are opened. Finally, Sunday has come. We're told that with their hearts still burning, the two men threw open the doors, ran along the same road they had earlier walked, found the gathered disciples in Jerusalem, and preached one of the first gospel sermons, proclaiming, It's true, the Lord has risen. Hallelujah. Maybe that's one answer to the question, what do we do when Easter comes and goes? With a heart still burning, do you run from your room, dash down the street, grab a friend by the shoulders in great love, and tell them the difference a relationship with God through Jesus Christ has made in your life? sharing your two- or three-minute before and after story. Maybe this year you'll be one who, with a burning heart, walks alongside the resurrected Christ, helping his kingdom come by ministering to those in need and finding ways to serve your neighbor in love. And church, who is your neighbor? Everybody is our neighbor, exactly. Maybe this year you'll be one among many who realize that there really isn't any better time to spread the good news than just after we've been celebrating Christ the shepherd throwing open the gates of heaven to his sheep. 
Or maybe you'll be the guy or girl who says, I come to church regularly. I put money in the plate each week. Isn't that enough? And here's where it may get a little uncomfortable. Because Christ wants more than your worship. He wants your help in accomplishing his work in the world. In Matthew chapter 4, we read about a couple of incidences that took place very early in Jesus' earthly ministry. Matthew 4, 18 through 20. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Out walking around one day, a former carpenter sees some fishermen. It doesn't seem like he was looking for Peter and Andrew specifically. It's like Jesus is saying, I can use anybody. I could use you. Follow me. John Orberg says, this is the great invitation to the human race. Follow me, Jesus says, and your life will be about more than how to make a living. Follow me, and you'll have something nobler to pursue than how to be more successful. Follow me, and you will learn what matters most, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Follow me, Jesus says. And you will be healed by mercy. You'll be captured by a vision of eternity. You will be undone by grace. Follow me, and you'll have a hope stronger than death. You will feed the hungry and love the lonely and serve the forgotten. Follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. With God's power, you will change history one life at a time. They'd never received an offer like this. Nobody ever had. Jesus comes to these two fishermen and hands them the gospel. This explosive good news that the presence, forgiveness, power, love, and favor of God on earth is now available in a fresh way to everybody on the planet through this man, this carpenter, this Jesus. This is the gospel. And they, we, must decide how to respond. We know how these two fishermen responded with a simple step of faith that would upend their lives and change the world forever. Matthew says, they left your nets at once and followed him. Something about this man, Jesus, caused them to grasp in the moment that this is a chance of a lifetime. And so they left their nets. Everyone has nets. Their nets were their security, their identity, their familiar world, and they just up and left them behind. I wonder what your nets are. These two fishermen decided they'd be Jesus-obeying, Jesus-loving, Jesus-centered people the rest of their lives. They'd counted a privilege to suffer with him and die for him. They had a why that meant they could face any how. That's their story. Now let's read the next in the same chapter from Matthew, verses 21 and 22. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw the two other brothers, John and James, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And Jesus called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their nets and their father behind. Does this remind you at all of the previous story we just read? Of course it does. It's repetitive. Why would Matthew do this? In those days, there were no italics, no boldface type. You couldn't change from lowercase to uppercase because there was no such thing as lowercase in Jesus' time. Repetition is the Bible's way of underlining. Through his repetition, by telling almost identical stories of these fishermen's call to follow Jesus, Matthew is telling us this is a critical point. This is crucial. This is the great decision of human life. This is your why that can get you through any how. 
This is so important that Jesus phrased his why in common terms, that these untrained, uneducated, uncouth fishermen could get right away. If they were servants, he might have said, you've been cleaning homes, I'll help you clean hearts. If they were cobblers, he might have said, you've been repairing souls, S-O-L-E-S, I'll help you repair souls, S-O-U-L-S. I thought you'd like that better than that. You know, he probably wouldn't have said that, but he might have. Jesus doesn't say, follow me and I'll save you. He doesn't say, follow me and you'll be okay. He says, follow me and I'll use you. Follow me and together we'll change the world. These followers of Jesus were given a new why to live for. The gospel is an invitation to meet the one true and living God in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the way who shows us the way. He is the truth who reveals the truth in us. He is the life who gives us life. And the primary and most compelling way the world can know the love of God is to experience it through those of us who claim to love him. Jesus' deal was, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. And that's still the deal 2,000 years later. That's our why as a church, why we exist, to make more and better followers of Jesus Christ. Because God loves the world so much. God's plan is to bring everyone into a life-giving relationship with him, for no one to be left behind. And you and I were saved to bring that message to others who cross, cross our paths every day, at the gym, the grocery store, at your place of work. Wherever we are at any given moment during any given encounter, we are all missionaries for Christ. That is our highest calling. Our job, if you will, regardless of what it says on your business card. There was a story I heard a number of years ago during a corporate downsizing. This manager was told he'd be let go from his computer-based company in six months and was asked, would you try to get everything transferred over before you leave? Well, he performed with such vigor and good attitude that the senior executives of the company noticed it. They not only kept him on, They asked, why is this happening? You have an attitude we haven't seen before in others, which presented him with the perfect opportunity to witness how his faith helped him see the bigger picture, to handle uncertainty with certainty, to serve Christ in his workplace. In 1 Peter 3.15, we read, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. We are seeing incredible God sightings, hearing inspiring stories from our efforts with the Monday night dinners over at Grace Church in Orient Park, from the Friday night outreach to folks in Dover through our Hispanic ministry, helping homeless families gain job skills, find jobs, and put a roof over their heads through family promise. Paul and Barbara Brooks were sharing with some of us the other night how they found themselves last Monday tending to a young homeless man whose feet were in bad shape. In pain, he wept and cried out, why are you doing this for me? And Paul, who says he felt completely inadequate to the task, but filled with compassion for this young man's plight, grabbed the first aid kit from his car, pulled off his own dry socks to give him, and simply said, because we love Jesus and he loves you. Paul and Barbara are just one more example of so many people in this church whose why gives them the courage to step far outside their comfort zone to minister to others. It's been said that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies those he's called. Our responsibility is simply to be an example of Christ's love, to share the good news when the opportunity presents itself, sometimes with words, more often by our actions, 
and then let God take it from there. So what do we do when Easter comes and goes? We look for the people God puts in our path for whom it is still Friday morning, and we allow ourselves to be instruments of change. How? Some of you are asking. I'm not qualified. I'm too shy. That's not like me. The Bible is filled with stories of people who weren't qualified and God called them to serve him nonetheless. This church is full of people who accomplish amazing things for the kingdom that go far beyond their own abilities. Working with children and youth, befriending the poor and needy, running tech, greeting a cross-section of our community as a front desk volunteer, becoming prayer warriors, going on mission trips to third world countries without knowing the language. They are able to do these remarkable things, able to extend love even as they dangle far outside their comfort zones because their why, Jesus, is bigger than their fears. You too have the why that can get you through anyhow. At New Hope, our strategy for drawing more people to Jesus is not complicated. We reach out to others not yet here and invite them in. Once here, we try and connect them more closely to God and others for support and encouragement, the best way to help them grow in their faith. And then we send them, send you, out to serve others in the name of Christ, to help make the kingdom come here in Brandon and beyond. Like Thomas, we can be bold in our faith because of the personal relationship we have with our risen Lord and the relationships we form with those he loves. God's love for us cultivates God's love in us so that we can become active participants in Christ's redeeming work in the world, making more of the kingdom a reality right here and right now, turning the world right side up, one life at a time. If you are intrigued about Jesus and the impact he's had on our world, I encourage you after this service to step into S3, which is a room on the other side of this wall where Reverend Vicki is going to start a new class called Who Is This Man? And the title's longer. It's something like The Remarkable Life of Jesus. But you get the idea. Uh, she and I will be team teaching the course over the next five weeks. If you're not part of a small group, Yet, uh, let me encourage you to take this first step. But let's pray. Father God, sharing our faith is such a privilege. We understand that people don't want to be preached at. They don't want to be condemned. They don't want to be on the receiving end of a polished gospel sales presentation. But they do want hope. And so we share our faith and the difference your love has made in our lives sometimes with words, but more often through our actions. Abba, Father, thank you for your Son, Jesus, through whom you revealed your love for us and in whom you show us what love is. Come, Holy Spirit, and empower this kind of love in those of us who follow Jesus for the sake of the world you love. To your glory, God, forever and ever. Amen.